I'm Jake Edwards. I'm a director at Social Finance. We're a nonprofit, uh, and our mission is to mobilize capital to drive social progress. And we do that by structuring a range of outcome-based and performance-based tools that sit at the intersection of the public, private, and social sectors. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of moderating uh, the panel today with a group of close friends and colleagues who I've been able to work with uh, closely over the past few years. Um, the foundation for this discussion in this panel is based on one truth and one hypothesis. The truth is that there are finite sources of revenue to invest in the upskilling, reskilling, and training of individuals in our society. Those sources are government, philanthropy, employers, individuals themselves. The hypothesis is that the needs of our communities uh, are so vast that the resources of one single of those stakeholders is insufficient. Um, insufficient to actually provide folks with the skills they need to thrive and achieve the American dream in a rapidly evolving and complex economy. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to dive into how folks can use their own capital deployment strategies to ultimately crowd in, leverage, and incent those various stakeholders to collaborate, coordinate, and drive the greatest possible impact they can for the folks that they're serving. Um, to start, I'm, we're fortunate to have Stuart here. Stuart uh, is a tremendous resource and expert in the arena of financing workforce development. I had the pleasure of meeting Stuart five years ago in Louisiana on a panel at Jobs for the Future about pay for success. It was a much newer space then. And since then, Stuart's gone on to chapter, to author, a three, uh, three series of thousand page plus publication called Investing in Workforce. So Stuart, would love for you to give a little bit of backdrop for the situation we find ourselves in, the macroeconomic challenges that we face, the various ways in which we can finance workforce development, and some key insights and themes that you found through your research. Um, sure. So I'm excited to be here. It's really interesting to get to be with um, a group of people that are are pursuing social impact through investment. Um, this is not my normal space. I spend most of my uh, time in looking at effective workforce development policy and education policy. So it's a really interesting thing. But a few years ago, we really started to look into um, the role that the funding and financing system played in driving outcomes in, in workforce development. And I, I want to talk about a few things. The first is that there's a lot of money that gets spent on education and training and trying to get people connected to jobs. Um, but there's a lot of dissatisfaction with that, and it's not necessarily reaching the right people. Employers are big spenders, but it often doesn't reach the actual occupations that they say that they have trouble filling and meeting their kind of frontline business needs. Um, government has had massive declines in the ways that they spend, uh, or in the amounts that they spend and the ways that they spend money. Um, in, in a few of the core kind of skills training programs that the government investment is down nearly 90% since the 80s. Um, Individuals um, have shown a real serious um, willingness to invest in themselves. There's about $120 billion of originations in student loans every year. Um, but there are certainly plenty of headlines that suggest that some people are not meeting, er, not getting the, the hope that they had out of those student loans. Um, one of the problems is that, and, and, and so one of the, the strains that we saw is that a lot of people were really looking at investments in skill um, as costs. They, they really started to say, um, you know, these are things that cost money and we're not sure that we want to do them. And you could start to see that reticence in kind of all of the various players that are involved in it. We were interested in, in kind of trying to take an investment mindset um, to, to the whole space. And, and I would say that one of the things that, that we thought that an investment mindset could do by thinking about return on investment to all of these, whether it's social um, or actual financial returns, is that it could help get money to effective programs and help them to scale. Um, it could help government re, uh, 
reorganize the relationship that they had with people that they contracted with to help drive and, and pay for quality. Um, and it would help individuals manage risk in, the, in, a, in a world where they're making very difficult choices. Um, so one, one of the things that we've been doing is really trying to look to the tools of finance to improve the funding quality and scaling of, of those programs, which is what has brought us here today. Um, we think that there's some great promise in outcomes-based finance, um, in, in workforce development, in education and higher ed as well, um, in a world of, of quickly changing work and, and demands for higher education. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so we're fortunate to have folks um, from a range of organizations that spend their days figuring out how they can deploy their capital to achieve the greatest impact. They do that through a range of deployment strategies, from grant capital to catalytic capital to market rate returns, all with slightly unique focuses, somewhat overlapping target populations, but distinct theses. Um, so Isabel, would love to hear a little bit about your strategy, your focus, and then similarly, Sarah can pass it on to you, and Justin would love to hear the same. What is your mandate? What is your focus? And what are the tools in your toolbox that you ultimately can use to achieve that objective? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm Isabel How. I work for the Omidyar Network, which is the philanthropic investment firm of uh, Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, and his wife Pam. Um, and in U.S. education, we have a two-generation strategy focused on one end on the littlest learners, um, uh, birth to five, uh, which is obviously not the main topic of, of this panel, although there is a lot of connections. Um, and then the other end of our strategy is focused on adult learners and specifically those who have children, which happens to be actually nicely a nice overlap. About 75% of adult learners happen to have a dependent child. Um, so that's, uh, that's our overall strategy, um, uh, trying to bring uh, economic mobility into family units and um, ensuring that people at the start of life have uh, an ability to have high quality um, learning opportunities. Hi, my name is Sarah Kay and I'm with Prudential. I work on the corporate social responsibility team that's part of the broader diversity, inclusion, and impact um, group. And we manage um, a couple of different financial resources, our employee time and talent, and the inclusion and diversity efforts um, of the enterprise around recruitment, retention, and promotion of diverse candidates. Um, within the financial resources side, we manage uh, philanthropic grants, corporate sponsorships, corporate partnerships, and our skills-based volunteer program and then we also work closely with our impact and responsible investing team uh, that makes impact investments in social enterprises VC funds uh, real estate development projects and our mission statement is the company's mission statement which is to solve the financial challenges of a changing world with a lens towards underserved communities. And so we focus on how do we drive inclusive economic growth through a couple of different program uh, focus areas. One is around closing the skills gap. How do we make sure that people have the um, are connecting to high quality skills training program to be able to compete for and succeed in a good job? How do we wanna make sure that a job is actually of quality and it's not a bad job? Um, we also look at how do we either scale, create, develop, uh, connect, low-income populations to financial products and tools to help build their wealth and protect their assets. Um, we look at uh, systems change in communities, particularly in our headquarter city of Newark, New Jersey, where we were founded in improving the public education, uh, public safety, and workforce development and economic development uh, systems. And then finally, we also focus on disaster relief and recovery um, on a global level. Thank you. This is Sarah's third panel in a row, so she's got her, she's got her talk track down. Um, Justin, how about yourself? Yeah, so my name is Justin Steele. I lead the Americas team for Google.org. Google.org is Google's philanthropy. Uh, when the company went public, it was established through an ongoing commitment of 1% of net profit set aside for cash grants to nonprofits. So every year, Google.org gives out over $250 million of cash grants based on that 1% commitment. And I have the privilege of being able to lead all of that work in the US, Canada, and Latin America for the team. 
Um, we have several different topical giving areas, but the economic opportunity is, is the largest one. And within that, uh, we definitely have a lot of work focused on um, skilling for uh, Americans. And you know, part of this is the recognition of the changing nature of work in the country. Um, you know, 15 years ago, uh, only around 40% of jobs in this country required a medium or high level digital skills. Uh, today, that number is 70%. So if you're gonna get uh, a job in this country, it's very likely that you're gonna need a medium more high level of digital skilling in order to be able to be successful in those positions. And we also know, I mean, I have, I have three kids who are in elementary school and Oakland Public Schools, and um, you know, the research shows that 60% of kids who are in grade school are gonna work in jobs that don't even exist today. So like the economy's changing, uh, digital skilling is becoming more and more relevant. And so one of the things that we're really focused on is how do we, uh, you know, give Americans, um, you know, and in, uh, in across my other region in Canada and Latin America, the, the relevant skills to be able to take the, the jobs of today. So we've um, you know, done some work with social finance. My colleague Andrew Dunkelman, who leads our topical strategy work around economic opportunity, um, has pioneered a lot of that. And then my team making grants in our region to nonprofits who are innovating on models of job skilling. I should also say I worked at Year Up for five years before I came to Google. So, um, you know, I spent five years training young people uh, to get jobs in the tech sector before I took this job. So I kind of have that double hat of nonprofit person who was working with young people in this capacity and now funding this work. Excellent. Um, so Stuart, you mentioned that there are trends with regards to the various revenue sources for investing in s skills and that some of those are going down, some of those are actually trending in the other direction, people are willing to invest in themselves. Um, Isabel, Sarah, and Justin, would love to hear an initiative or an investment that you all made with either the direct or the indirect objective of crowding in additional capital, additional resources from any of the other stakeholders that should be thinking about workforce from an investment lens rather than a cost lens. Justin, you want to come back around or? Sure, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, so two of the investments that my colleague Andrew has led uh, with social finance in Merit America, um, but I won't speak to those because I don't know them as well. Um, I'll speak to a grant that my team is making in New York City and it's not public so I can't give all the details, but um, we just made a, a $2 million grant to, to a nonprofit in New York City that's retraining uh, low-income New Yorkers for, for jobs and technology and using income sharing agreements um, you know, to experiment and pilot and try to learn uh, whether those agreements could work. And that that nonprofit has seen that you know, the average income of the person who's coming in to be trained is $18,000 and they're training in software development. So 80% uh, of the people who uh, graduate the program end up getting jobs and the average salary of those jobs is 85,000. So it's a, it's a like, hugely significant jump. And the way they structured that agreement is that if you uh, f make a salary over $60,000 a year, that you would then for, for three years pay 12% of that base salary uh, you know, back to the organization to cover all the costs because while they're in the program, it's zero cost plus they get a stipend. So you're sort of trying to come back and, and cover the cost. I think the other thing that we generally think about is the fact that there's just not enough research about what actually works in this space. And so trying to fund uh, you know, measurement and evaluation to prove which programs are working and hopefully incentivize the government to you know, get some of that big government funding to come back in. Sarah? Um, one example that I'll give, we, you know, we've been working with social finance for um, quite some time, but, and I'll talk about well, one piece of work later, but um, another organization that we've been supporting is called Third Sector, who's another uh, intermediary partner in the pay for success space. And we uh, supported them a, a two years ago to work with five local workforce investment boards in five local communities across the country, um, which included San Diego, Austin, uh, Northern Virginia, and I'm forgetting the other two, but um, basically they were looking at how to restructure um, the WIOA contracts with workforce organizations to create pay for performance contracts. And so we were looking at, you know, before WIOA dollars went out to these workforce training programs and they went out at the beginning and it didn't matter, you know, even if the students fully graduated from the program, whether or not they get placed, whether or not they're still employed six months later, it was really for training's sake. Um, and so what the pay for performance contract looks like, and there's three different options, is one, you know, you can split the payment 
let's just say 50% upfront and then 50% when the person gets placed into a job, or it could be uh, you get the full payment upfront and then get a bonus if that person gets um, placed, or you don't get any money upfront and then the full payment comes once the person is placed. And that's really to drive governments to think about outcomes um, and really thinking about the results versus um, just paying for the upfront training without knowing if the training programs are actually being successful in changing people's trajectory. Thank you. Isabel? Yeah, one, one organization that we have founded but has done a really nice job at uh, cross-partnership collaboration is uh, Hall Button School. Uh, so we had funded the organization when they had only one site in San Francisco, and it's a two-year uh, software engineering uh, pathway uh, that doesn't have any requirement up front, uh, with one exception, you have to be 18 year old. Um, so there is no high school, no um, education requirement, no uh, software, pre-skill pre, pre, pre on, on software engineering requirement. Um, and at exit of this program, their average uh, salary is now 108,000 uh, with, a, with, a, with a, a very diverse cohort of 70% uh, people of color and 40% women. So that school has now expanded in multi, multiple locations uh, through cross partnerships. Um, so in Connecticut, the um, uh, received funding from uh, from the state uh, of Connecticut, which, which saw an opportunity to expand that very successful model in uh, in New Haven, uh, as well as found some uh, philanthropy uh, to start the efforts there. Uh, they just announced uh, an expansion in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where similarly they are partnering with the city as well as. Uh, uh, with a philanthropy there to provide not only the curriculum but also stipends um, and free housing uh, for the students as a way to see if uh, there is a potential expansion opportunity in um, states that are not by coastal um, and attract students toward uh, promising careers outside of uh, 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 outside of certainly uh, the Silicon Valley or uh, East Coast. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so I think we heard a couple of mechanisms to get individual resources in, in a way that's outcome oriented, providing downside protection. Um, we heard about ways to reorient how the public sector is spending its dollars and linking those to performance and outcomes and driving dollars towards effective programs. How about employers? Any uh, examples of mechanisms or strategies whereby you can directly or indirectly get employers to invest in their workforce and or be willing to share in the value that they see from having access to qualified, diverse talent pipelines? Is that anything that came up in your research, Stuart? Anyone else have particular examples they want to share? Um, I can talk about it a little bit and say that it, uh, there's, there's a there's a strong need. I mean, there's a constant uh, drumbeat from employers that there are challenges with pro uh, workers remaining productive, skills gaps, um, and, and big, big challenges in, in filling that. Um, there's significant, and, and I'll say there's a couple reasons that for this, is that there's significant um, reluctance to invest in the front line. A few, there are a few headwinds that exist. So accounting principles suggest that it's advantageous to invest in technology and capital rather than than in human capital because it doesn't sit on your books anywhere. Um, but there's also, I, I think that one of the challenges is that is that firms are busy doing what they do and it's very difficult for them to do the evaluative work. So you'll see partnerships with Europe that have shown real success. But when you start to talk about at at broad, broad scale, it's difficult. And I think it's also a little bit of a challenge to expect firms to invest in something, hire people, and not know whether they're actually getting what they need to get, which is why creating some opportunities for employers to share that risk with the public sector or with individuals is a, is a great opportunity. Um, there are examples that are bubbling up of uh, not necessarily self-funding, but recycling funds or where employers 
pay back some portion of the amount uh, that individuals have invested or the, some portion of the value that they see for getting workers that are qualified that help solve things that are, are legitimate costs that they don't always account for, like turnover cost advertising and getting workers trained on the job. Those types of things, there, there are ways that you can create some shared value. Um, those, those are a few examples. Anyone else? Probably yeah. more. Okay, I'm much more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I was not, uh, as of a few years ago, I think there is a huge trend right now, and it's probably uh, in connection with a very good macroeconomic environment that we are in, but employers are showing meaningful innovations right now. So you have big employers like Starbucks announcing a partnership with ASU to fund uh, education for their workers, or Walmart, or Bright Horizons now funding all education, 100% of the education for early childhood educators within their um, uh, early childhood schools um, and preschool environments. You also have the emergence of uh, learn and earn models that I think are really interesting. Um, uh, whether it's at Miami-Dade partnering with Tesla on uh, uh, a program where uh, students at Miami-Dade can now get funding in addition to not having any cost whatsoever to pay for their education. Uh, or for-profit companies like Tectonic in Colorado that has also uh, an apprenticeship program where students are also getting paid while they get their training. I think those models are really interesting. I, I think this is a, employers are actually finally showing a lot of innovation uh, and willingness to fund um, um, uh, either education as a benefit or learn on own model. I do wonder whether that's happening at the most knowledge intensive end of the economy, because if you look at the way that high tech companies have structured their employment, I mean, we've essentially like, disintermediated like middle management and entry level is outsourced to vendors and contractors. So there is no pathway from the mail room to the C-suite like that just literally doesn't exist. And so there's, there's almost no entry level employment. Like you have to have graduated from a strong college and have work experience. And so there are some jobs at the company that you could argue are entry level, but the demand to get into that pathway is so high that you can hire a UC Berkeley computer scientist to do a job that probably a year of alumni could do anyway. And so to get to get those pathways to actually open up to people like Year Up, I mean, I'm, I was meeting with our CIO last week and it's like, you have to intentionally choose to open up those pathways and protect those pathways. And we've done some of that through like an IT rotational program for IT support and year up largely like funnels through that pathway. But there's pressure on the CIO all the time to open that pathway to elite college graduates or you have executives at the company who say, I know a talented young person, this is one of our only entry level roles, can this person get drafted into this program? And there's other like jobs around, you know, technical support of like ad sales and things like that that could probably be done by people without college degrees, but somebody at the company has to make a deliberate choice to open up the pathway and hire people who have you know, non-traditional backgrounds when they could be hiring college graduates. So it's interesting, like I, it's like a macro problem, but I, I don't know that the companies at the, the most knowledge intensive end of the economy are creating those pathways or being very innovative about how to protect pathways for people to be able to come in in a non-traditional way. I'm more on Isabella's. Got divide uh, right yeah. down the middle here. Of <laughs> uh, being more optimistic, I do think, you know, I don't think we've yet seen an employer based pay for success model. I think we're getting there. I think we're, you know, employers are recognizing that they have to invest in their current employees and future employees. Uh, there's a return on investment that is cheaper than the turnover rates that they're seeing. Um, internally at Prudential, we have a massive future of work initiative that's launching about upskilling and reskilling our own employees. Um, you know, some of it is ingrown training, others are working with vendors, both on the for profit and the nonprofit side around that reskilling. Um, so definitely paying for the education and the learning that's happening and then uh, ultimately supporting organizations. And we, we all keep mentioning Year Up. Um, you know, that's another great partner in the sense that we're actually building pipelines of talent that's coming from those organizations. So, you know, I think we're in the right direction on that side and seeing outcomes based um, payers be the employers. Um, and I think the market is shifting that way to um, 
actually prove that the results are, are worthwhile. And can, so I think that one of the challenges also that you hear from employers is that they're concerned that if they make the investment that their competitor is going to reap the benefits. So they'll, they'll lose that employer employee to another employer, which is, I, I think this is another space that investment could get bigger behind is actual sector-based training, where it's not just one firm making the investments. And the idea, I mean, so the, the concept that you work for one firm and you travel this pathway up is wonderful. Um, but it's not realistic in many cases. And so there's competitors, and if they, if they say, hey, we can solve some of these labor market challenges in non-competitive manners, we can all invest in similar training that we're all gonna need. Even if it changes in five years, then we all lose a little bit. Those are, those are promising practices, at least, and there are cities across the country that have tried to do this. They have not gotten very, very big, but there are some of those. I, I think that there's also, there's so much firm level strategy, because I think that a lot of the programs, like the ASU programs and Amazon's college tuition reimbursement, is often about lengthening, and, and, and so this is, I, I think, probably some of the mental uh, work that happens as they make these programs is they're saying if we can keep high skill warehouse workers around for five years instead of 18 months, that's a huge win. So we'll pay for college and it's, it's a win-win for us because not everyone's going to take us up on free college um, and it keeps our highest capacity people around for five years. We know we can't retain them. Uh, or, and they could probably do a lot more to figure out how they take those high capacity people and then move them into the knowledge space at Amazon or Walmart or all the places that are doing these types of things. So there's, there's real space for that, but there are different ways that you can a, a approach the needs of the firm to do that. That's what I really want to know is like how much are the folks coming through those pipelines actually getting into the jobs that lead to real wealth creation? I mean, I think about low-income commun communities of color in this country and how they've been locked out of wealth and like we're training them into these jobs, but like do the, does the ladder even exist anymore? Like are the rungs between like the steps on the ladder so wide that you train people, they can climb the first few steps and they might be able to get into you know, ideally like a middle class job, but are they gonna really be able to build wealth if the rungs are so significant between the steps? Can I respond to that? Please do, I my job's become very easy. <laughs> um, a couple of thoughts that I have is, I shared this study in a previous panel, but um, Prudential, we have a lot of manufacturing clients, and so we surveyed about a thousand com manufacturing companies about the future of work, and do they th feel like they have the workers they need, and over 70, 80% of them felt like they don't have the current workforce that is needed for the future. Um, but then, uh, we also survey the employees in the, in the company as well, and they also expect the employer to provide the training, not to go through an outside institution. And so I think that, you know, with the whole future of work and workers and workplace, I think there is a conscious and intentional thought process that people are putting on how to upskill and reskill our uh, their current base of employees. And so speaking of the wealth creation and the ladder building, I think that, that we're going to see more of that as these jobs that have been more, you know, entry level and don't require as much higher level skills, they're going to be reskilling and upskilling their employees for better jobs that with higher sa salaries um, by providing their own training. Higher yeah. salaries, but like wealth generating jobs? Because the jobs you just described don't sound like wealth generating jobs to me. I think there's going to be a combination of both. I think the jobs that we're going to see in terms of um, the automation of a lot of the manufacturing jobs. So, you know, I think, of course, with some of the automation, you're going to see some of the jobs disappear. But at the same time, we're going to need people to manage uh, the different systems. And I think those jobs are going to be at a higher level with a higher paying salary level. Yeah, I'll step outside of my moderator shoes for a moment and say I think that there's almost two different things at play here. Um, and there is the initial point of entry and the access pathway for individuals that might be disadvantaged and underserved. And then there is the employers providing access to upskilling and investing in their own incumbent workers as a retention play. I think I'm probably a little bit more optimistic on the latter. I think the former, to Justin's point, is how building those pathways is really hard. It takes a lot of time. It takes a cultural shift, a mindset shift, requires top-down buy-in, and really um, requires a, a shift in, in how we think about the value of talent that might not look as traditional as what we're used to. Hardest thing I've tried to do at Google. 
What'd you say? It's the hardest thing I've tried to do at Google. So how do you do it? Well, any you can, I haven't. I haven't done it yet. I don't have any examples to really share. I mean, we've expanded the year up pathway, but that already existed before I came five years ago. But it is, it is the hardest thing to create real pathways, both entry points like on ramps and to create pathways up through. Uh, it, it's, it's like the cult, it requires culture shifts, like macroeconomic sort of pressures are pushing away from that. We don't, I mean, you know, to the point earlier, like we don't train anymore. We don't have those kind of like entry level training programs. They're not internal, right? Like you don't come to the company and then go through like Google University and get trained up. Like that doesn't really exist anymore. The yeah. corporate investment in internal training is significantly decreased over time. So it's, it's, a, it's a structural problem that's hugely intimidating and hard to crack. Stuart, what's your training, employer training statistic in the C-suite? I'm forgetting which one. Eighty-five percent of dollars oh, spent by employers. So yeah, about eighty-five percent. So so I'll I'll, I'll say this. Um, just in terms of actual hard money that employers spend, it's about one hundred fifty. Depending on which estimate you believe, one hundred fifty to two hundred billion dollars a year gets spent on hard investment. So money that someone spends to pay someone to do training. Firms spend about that much annually. If you then include things like mentoring, coaching, and informal training that are provided through soft costs, lost productivity or trailing shifts, anything like that, that number is about, in total, so another, about another $350 billion. So about a half trillion dollars a year employers spend on, on training. The vast majority of that, over 80%, goes to workers that already have a bachelor's degree. Right. So depending on who you are, and, and my employer could, in the accounting um, ledger, list this as a tra my, my travel, my registration to this conference as, as part of that money. Yeah. And so most of that goes to this, because conferences and travel and executive training are very, very expensive compared to other things. And this is true, this is true since the early 90s that fewer em employees uh, report on the job training or employer funded training. It's down to like one out of five employees say that they've gotten something in that, in that range. Now that's survey, so an employer might say that they're serving more, but very few people say that they're actually getting access to that. Um, a lot of this, you know, it's, it's, it's then you look at executive surveys, I'll say, and, and very much you don't see executive surveys saying we're having difficulty hiring people to mid-management. Right. You, you look at those surveys and it says, says we're having serious concerns because we've got big uh, expectations for automation and very difficult time recruiting people in sales, IT, customer service. Um, so there's, there's some mismatch. I think that there's going to be pressure. I, I actually do have some hope about this, is that there's pressure the that these are long-term things. It's not just going to be a cyclical issue that we have low unemployment rates, but we have a lot of retirements coming. We have a rapidly diversifying population and workforce, and that's going to make integration and skills development, especially in a lot of these jobs, critical long-term. Uh, I think that we're in this world right now where we have to figure out how we're going to sail through that challenge. Shifting a little bit, um, you all have your own focuses, investment strategies, theses. As you make those uh, deployments, how are you thinking about holding yourselves accountable to success? What does success look like? Um, and ultimately, what is, how does that play into the current and future deployment strategies? Is what you want to start? Yeah, so that's an area where uh, actually I would be very interested in hearing the answers from the other panelists because we, um, we have three goals. Um, one is uh, increasing post-secondary completion um, for student parents. So right now, 50% of uh, student parents, according to a recent um, U.S. Government Accountability Office report, drop out um, uh, or never complete, and that compares to about 30% average uh, population. So it's a much higher rate of dropout in a population that, um, that we are doing work uh, on. So, um, and, and completion is still, as of today, one of the greatest um, driver of economic mobility. Um, two, uh, we are looking at increase in income, uh, so economic mobility. 
uh, and that's on a relative basis. So I love Justin's point because it's on a relative basis and are we ambitious enough? Um, so that's a, an interesting uh, observation. Uh, and then three, we added a uh, well-being. Um, so we are looking at Gallup uh, that has five domains of, uh, of well-being uh, for adults. Um, uh, just thinking that a lot, of, a lot of people, including myself, have made choices in my life that were not only driven by economic outcomes, uh, they were driven by other factors, uh, many other factors uh, uh, that have to do with purpose, that have to do with where I live and community, that have to do where my family is. Uh, and so how do we factor those, 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 those into what success looks like at the individual level beyond simply looking at economic outcomes? So we're in the process right now of figuring out how to um, better think about impact. I would say we've been at a more superficial level in terms of our, uh, our thinking around it. I think um, you know, we're bringing in external vendors to help us think through that. I think up to this point, it's, you know, as I mentioned, it's what we, our mission, which is how do we make sure that more people have the opportunity to achieve financial security. But what underneath that is what we're trying to unpack, which is definitely around uh, income increases, um, how long they're staying at jobs, what do jobs look like. You know, we have a big focus on the quality of jobs. And so that means, you know, livable wages, safe working conditions, stable working schedules, career advancement opportunities, benefits that include include health insurance and retirement, and how are we changing people's behavior so it's not just about opening up a savings account, but are they actually starting to build their wealth? And so those are some of the components that we're thinking towards, and then what's the intersection of work and wealth? I think that's also a really big part where there have been changes in the labor and financial markets, and yet they're not talking to each other, they're not thinking together uh, collaboratively on the solutions, and so how do we better measure that? So I would say we are in a work in progress right now, um, and hopefully more to say in a couple of months. Justin? Yeah, I mean, p part of corporate social responsibility is always nose counting, so we were gonna like flash the big, huge numbers of like 10 million young people training computer science, and we just signed a pledge to you know, retrain 250,000 Americans over the next five years, so that's like the, the sort of like highest level. But then within each individual grant, I think it's the things that have already been said. It's sort of what's your retention rate? What's your average job placement rate? What's the average wage? Uh, is that wage stable one year out, two years out, three years out? And then particularly just thinking like across the sector, in particular income sharing agreements, like, you know, that's the partner with social finance is just trying to understand like, do these things work and are they scalable? And how do we get high training, uh, you know, job tra high quality job training programs to scale? Because uh, it's, you know, like year up is just, there's so much exceptionalism around that, but like how many nonprofits can have a budget over $100 million a year of annual revenue and have the philanthropy engine to drive that? How, how, what are other ways that we actually scale these programs? So, you know, on multiple levels. Awesome. Um, well, I, we have 20 minutes left. We have our 25 minutes for Q&A, so we're a little behind. If folks have questions, um, please either raise your hand or step up to the mic. We'd love uh, to hear from the audience on any thoughts or comments that they have for this group. I do have some backup questions, but opening up, please do. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, I'm from the National University of Singapore, where uh, as a student team, we have worked with a Singapore-based organization called Trisector Associates, uh, previously known as, previously it was the Asia arm of third sector capital in Singapore. Uh, so we helped them design uh, an impact bond for skills training in India. And one of the biggest challenges that we are facing is uh, our definition of employability, employment retention, is very different from how the government defines it. For example, the government says, if you're employed for just three months in a year, you're employed. But we are saying, no, you have to be employed for at least two years to show that the program is working. And so I want to know from experiences in the US and the West, how do you manage to uh, discuss with the governments on what the right outcome should be for measuring, because if they see outcomes as one way, and we look at it very differently. We're not able to get that convergence when we actually want to design an impact bond. Can I say that with, without thinking about the, the impact bond part, that's, that's one of the challenges that this whole field faces, is that there's so many different definitions of success. Um, just to talk about the federal government portion, there's 20 three 25 agencies 
in the federal government that provide funding for some type of skills training. They don't, there's no administrative alignment between them. So you might be an organization that receives two portions of funding, or funding from two different portions of the federal government, and you're going to have to have different reporting standards. That's a lot. That's a challenge for a nonprofit. It's one of the reasons that it's difficult to scale when you're dealing with that. Um, but it also, and, and so it makes places like Europe, uh, Europe probably does participate in many federal government programs, but some of the very effective programs say it's not worth the administrative cost and we're going to try it, and raise it. When I was there profit. five years ago, it was barely worth it. Right. And we leveraged it a tiny bit. Um, particularly, I was uh, leading the DC site, so we were leveraging some workforce investment funding through DC, but it was the hardest money. And we'd always ask ourselves, is this really worth it? Or should we just go pitch another high net worth person and get a grant to cover it? Right. Um, which makes complete sense, um, but it's not going to reach population no. scale. You have to get into, you have to deal with some of these, and some of this is doing the performance-based contracting, rethinking the way that government does a lot of these things is, is critical to make it work. Questions from other folks in the audience? Go ahead. Is there a movement in the government, and not to be on the spot to represent the whole government, but I mean, when we think about like employment and employment rates, you know, we're looking at jobs, but going back to the quality of like the quality of jobs, there's also, or like how much full employment what it looks like. I mean, that's like a gap even at like the macro level, you know, data that we're tracking. So is the sector at least like so, not all of you, are you all thinking? For those of you who might not be able to hear, um, Cliff Notes, uh, how are you all thinking about measures of success to further make a compelling argument and articulation to government to engage in scaling and investing in more effective solutions? Um, the, this is probably the appropriate time just to let everyone know this is a very, I'm not technically part of the federal government. Um, <laughs> so I, I, and I'm also supposed to tell you at the beginning, any time I say something, I'm not even speaking for my institution. Um, you can make what you want of that. Jackham House rules. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but you, you know, so, so the Federal Reserve spends a lot of time looking at the labor market. Um, Clearly, we're in a very low unemployment position right now. Um, a couple of things that I always think about, though, are that currently labor force participation has rebounded some since the Great Recession, but it actually resembles, it's been in decline since before the Great Recession. We have a labor force participation rate right now that looks more like the 1980s, when women were not fully entered into the workforce in the way that they were. Um, there are long-standing persistent disparities in unemployment. So you can call it the one and a half times or the two times rule of black to white unemployment. Um, if it's 3.7 right now, it's seven and a half for blacks. If it, in the recession when it was 10% for whites, it was 20% for blacks. Um, there are challenges that exist in the labor market and, and those are things that have lasted for, for decades that need some attention. I'll just add, um, you know, as unemployment is incredibly low right now, the income inequality, though, is incredibly vast and ever increasing. And so I think the reason why, at least in the United States, the government seems to be more interested in learning about, you know, these uh, pay for success or pay for performance types is, you know, it's basically the erosion of the American dream that if you worked hard and you got a good salary that you'd be able to buy a house, you know, send your kids to college, and that's just not a reality for most people anymore. And so how do we better work with nonprofit organizations and for-profit institutions to create better results around economic mobility and security for Americans? Um, and then to address the question that was before in terms of the measurements, I'll say, you know, we're still new in this pay for success on both the grant side and on the impact investment side, and it is an untested field and we're learning. And one of the things that I'm learning in this is to get market rate investors to invest in these type of pay for success models is that there are 
nuances to the deal in terms of the measurements of, you know, you know, who gets to participate in the program? What are the outcomes that we're looking for? Like, I'd love to see two years of retention, but that might be too long for investors. And so there's a lot of negotiation and compromise that's rooted in, you know, big evaluations and data, but is, is something that I'm still learning and is um, something that's definitely you know, people come at it with different varying viewpoints, but to make it successful, you know, you need to have a really strong infrastructure in place. So we are investing in a success measure for the little ones. Um, so, and that's um, actually related to the future of work because having a whole child approach starting from beginning, on a, beginning of life will hopefully yield results later on. So having social emotional learning and kids who are uh, creative minds and um, critical thinkers is what we want to see societally. So uh, we are investing in this in partnership with the federal government and a, in Child Trends, which is one of the most preeminent research firms in early childhood um, on a uh, success measure nationally. We have not invested yet on the workforce side. Um, uh, we are more in a learning mode at the media network on, 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 at the moment, um, especially around that idea of uh, well-being or wellness, or how could we have a bigger perspective on, a, on an individual person and the choices that they make. We invested in, um, you may have seen this, this was just published this week, in quality of jobs. How do we define quality of jobs? But it's not getting exactly to measurement yet. And hopeful that with more tech, more data, we will, because one of the big issues until now was outcome data. So how do you even track someone's outcomes over a certain period of time and reliability of those data. I think we are getting there on, the, on technology solutions and big data to do this. Um, so hopeful that um, there may be solutions that some of us can partner on uh, in, in, with the government over time. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Bethany. I'm a Kellogg MBA student. I was wondering, you talked a little bit earlier about kind of the idea of upward mobility, but I was curious about your thoughts within the workforce space on the trade-off between a wage and a living wage, and particularly as the labor market is so tight right now, you might be seeing people who might never have participated in the workforce before taking advantage of some of your programs. And so how do you think about giving them their first wage or a minimum wage versus giving them the opportunity to have a living wage? I think the flavor I would add to that is the geographic component to it, whereby the same occupation might provide a living wage in Ohio, but not be sufficient to cover rent in a city on the coast. And so how does that play into the way in which you're thinking about the cost effectiveness or the ROI of a program and ultimately how it should be availed to, to populations in need? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I think one of the challenges is recognizing that as middle class jobs are declining, how do you bring up the sort of lower wage service work that's booming, right? We're growing at the top and then we're growing at the base. And, you know, we've partnered with the National Domestic Workers Alliance to figure out how do you bring more wages and dignity to those service positions? How do you create portable benefits that people can sort of be bring between their jobs? And if you're a house cleaner, like how do you access benefits that would, you know, provide a safety net for you? And I think we really need to think hard uh, in this economy of how to bring those lower wage jobs up because those are growing tremendously. And I think the, I mean, I, the other part of it is you need to make sure that if you're in one of those jobs, I, we, we probably, many people can raise their hand and say that they worked in a job that was pretty low paying in, as their first job. And there's differences between first jobs, but are they traps? Are you stuck in it forever? And I think that we don't do a great job of creating pathways like we've talked about. Um, and so that's, that's really important. I'll, I'll do a shameless plug. We do a whole, we have a thing called the Opportunity Occupations Monitor. You all tech savvy, you can Google that. Um, and it's a look, we use 100 million job ads to look at the cost of living and adjust it and figure out what jobs pay above median wage regionally adjusted for cost of living and what type of jobs are available for people without a bachelor's degree that are gonna pay above median wage. And 
what jobs require a bachelor's degree but are not so well paying. And so one thing that we, we, we run a survey every year uh, called the Survey of Household Economic Decision Making, the SHED, um, which is where you'll hear the percent of the U.S. population that doesn't have cash savings or credit for a $400 emergency. Um, it's, that number has come down a lot, but it's still like a third of the population doesn't have that. One of the things that we constantly hear in reporting is that they would prefer a stable job. So there's lots of dimensions to a quality job beyond the wage. They would like to know that they got to work 40 hours a week rather than having an unpredictable schedule. They wanted to work during the day or they wanted to work in the evening to fit their life. So there are lots of things and, and stability and predictability in work for most workers in that survey is more important, and that's a nationally representative sample, more important than the actual wage if they had to take a trade off. So there are, there are lots of components to, to job quality. Also, maybe be provocative again and say, like, have we overtrained and do we overpay the top? Like, you know, somebody in my position, you have to have, you know, I have an engineering degree, I worked in management consulting, I have two master's degrees, I'm like 10 years in, post master's, like, it, and I think what I observe in these, like, knowledge economy jobs is that we then, we take these, like, super highly trained people, we put them at the top, we disintermediate a lot of middle management and just put everything on that tippy top, and we use technology to, like, augment those people to be able to be super managers and do everything and then we also let all of the sort of wages then pool up at the top and I just don't know that that's sustainable and I don't know the answer to that question either it's just something I've been thinking about. Ooh, is that applause? Snaps? <laughs> uh, go ahead. Hi, my name is Karen and I run a community development organization called Consult Your Community. And my question is, to what extent are rigorous evaluation um, processes like randomized control trials actually used when uh, measuring the efficacy of partnerships or even, you know, um, anything that you've administered in terms of a grant? I'm happy to actually go. Yeah. Um, so... Prudential um, engaged in one of our pay for success projects whereby we uh, scaled a program called Jewish Vocational Services in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. JVS is a tremendous organization in the greater Boston region with a track record of serving low income individuals across a range of different program tracks. Um, through this initiative, we were able to raise $12.2 million to help them expand their services to 2,000 immigrants and refugees. Um, and expand access to four particular program tracks across a range of different uh, intensities and immersiveness. So uh, a basic skills training for people that are looking to get their foot in the door at entry level job, a certified nurse's assistance and industry recognized credentialing track, and then a bridges to, to college track. Um, and within that program, uh, the, those four program tracks, we employed two different measurement and evaluation programs not programs, structures. One program has a randomized control trial. A thousand people will get the program, a thousand people will not. The other three programs have a pre-post. Based on where people started, was there material improvement in their income 24 months later? Um, so that randomized control trial, what we're actually measuring is, in a two-year period, what was the earnings differential for individuals that uh, engaged in the skills training program relative to a control group? And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will repay the upfront investment based on the actual measured causally attributed earnings impact on the program. Um, and so that's one example. In the 30 pay for success social impact bond projects in the United States, they all employ a range of different measurement and evaluation approaches. Um, and at the end of the day, that evaluation methodology has to match the program, the population, the ultimate objective and intent of the program. Um, and so it's the right tool in some instances and, and not the right tool in others. And that comes down to a series of conversations and, and discussions amongst the, the project partners. Um, anything else folks want to add around measurement and evaluation within their own portfolios? No, like I said, we're at the beginning stages. Um, and so we will, you know, we completely understand too to per ask for evaluation, a stringent evaluation that has randomized control trials that requires a lot of financial capital from our side. So we're also very conscious of the fact of how we look at our um, partners uh, individually and then as a portfolio as a whole. Yes, yeah, same for us. Uh, we 
track and we have uh, goals on how many of our portfolio organizations have different rigorous different types of rigorous evaluation there is a, a spectrum even an rct i mean an rct if uh, if it's done in a controlled environment may not actually be scalable or may not you know different may not be conclusive on whether something that works in a particular city or region will work in others. Um, so even our cities are not perfect, um, and they are expensive. Uh, there are a variety of evaluation methodologies uh, that one can use. Um, we are big fans. Uh, I think the field needs more rigorous evidence and evaluation. So uh, we are tracking overall as a portfolio with a, with a, with a goal of having uh, a meaningful percentage of our organizations move over time toward that goal. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. Take both questions, and we'll crowdsource them uh, across the stage. Sure. Hopefully, uh, mine's an easy one. My name's John. I'm with a corporate venture fund called Pearson Ventures. Uh, other than Stewart's publications and the occupations, opportunities, monitors, do you have any recommended resources or reading so that we could take this topic back home with us when we leave the conference and continue to learn? Stewart's publication is long. So if you start yeah. it now, by next SOCAP, we can talk about it. Uh, second question. That would require less than 10 pages of reading a day. So, Yeah, so uh, my name is Alex. I run a uh, city-funded accelerator for low to moderate income uh, residents in San Diego to build businesses. And one of the things I was wondering about is, are, are there any models or things that you are looking at to sort of pair um, people who are seeking jobs and job training with the individuals that are actually sort of creating their own jobs from sort of an entrepreneurship standpoint? So that seems to be sort of a big gap where they need employees, but they can't seem to find them because most of the programs are putting people in sort of larger organizations. Thoughts on either of those questions? On the first question, I'll say social finance has a ton of resources and publications that they've put out um, and will soon actually maybe not soon, in relatively some time in the future, we'll be putting out a book particularly uh, with the Federal Reserve Banks on ISAs. Other resources? Stuart, where do you get all your information from? Aside from me? Um, no, so I, I will say... generating font of knowledge. We, we've, we've put together, at least for the Federal Reserve, um, on, on finance-related issues. If you get onto our website, the uh, Center for Workforce and Economic Opportunity, we've, we've pulled together all of the work that's happened on the Community Reinvestment Act and workforce development, and so you can find that all in one place. Um, there are, in, in terms of written work on the finance portion of, of workforce development, there's, there's not a lot. There's a now 12-year-old ebook that you can find written by Heath Prince um, that's got a lot, and it's got more than just outcomes-based. It's got uh, state bonding efforts. It's got a lot of kind of uh, the reapplications of the tax improvement or uh, TIF districts to to training and uh, connections with economic development organizations, the way community colleges have funded themselves. So there are different types of innovation, but there's not a lot written on it. Um, I'm happy. Uh, you you can consider me a resource if you have questions about something you're looking for. I'm happy to to do my best to try and answer it. We just don't do a ton of promotion of non-Fed stuff. But there's a lot of, there, there's good stuff out there. You won't find it on our website, at least. Thoughts on the second question? Kind of connecting entrepreneurs, individuals looking for jobs as a way to, to stimulate local economies, address skills gaps, financing constraints? I love the question. I think it's un, underexplored. We, we just made our first commitment to small and medium-sized businesses, like, three weeks ago, and so it's gonna be a huge focus for us in 2020, and I love the nudge to like explore the intersection. We've been doing all this skills training work and job creation work, and now we're gonna be doing like access to capital for underserved entrepreneurs, so definitely promoting people who might be able to work for themselves, but then it's also interesting to think about how might you be able to have some of those pathways actually go into small, medium-sized businesses, which the majority of Americans are employed in small businesses anyway, right? So it's, it's a good question, I appreciate it. So we are doing a lot of work in childcare, that happens to be only small and medium-sized enterprises um, and low-income workers. Um, uh, so that's an area of specific focus on our early childhood strategy. Um, 
um, where we are seeing some models emerging of not only quality outcomes for the little ones, but also economic empowerment for the caregivers, um, very promising ones. Excellent. Well, we are at time. Please give a big thank you to the panel.